It's dawn on the 2nd of June 1917 over the German airfield at Estormel, France. As a sleepy ground crew prepares seven aircraft for an early morning mission, a lone British Newport drops out of the clouds and launches a surprise attack. Captain William Avery Bishop, a Canadian ace with 21 victories, streaks down on the unsuspecting Albatross fighters, spraying them with a burst from his wing-mounted Lewis machine gun. Turning for another pass, he spots a lone Albatross rising from the ground and fixes his attention on the machine. Dispatching this brave German, three more take to the air as Bishop circles for another attack. Desperately fighting off all three Albatross fighters, Bishop makes good his escape and returns to his base at Philly le champ farm near Arras in triumph. Two months later, Bishop is awarded the coveted Victoria Cross for this lone wolf attack. The only problem is, some people say that this action never happened. Bishop fabricated the entire event, as well as lying about the majority of his final 72 official victories. William Avery Bishop was born in Owen Sound, Ontario, Canada in 1894 and showed a keen interest in flying from a young age, nearly killing himself by jumping off a roof in a cardboard flying machine of his own design. Joining the Royal Military College of Canada in 1911, Reportedly due to a lack of academic aptitude, he had a disappointing record. Failing his first year and caught cheating in his final exam, Bishop was almost saved by the outbreak of the Great War. Joining the Mississauga Horse Cavalry Regiment, Bishop was commissioned but missed deployment to Europe due to pneumonia. He was transferred to the 7th Canadian Mounted Rifles, a mounted infantry unit where his skills with a rifle due to his self-proclaimed superhuman eyesight, began the first spark of his naturally boastful nature and penchant for self-promotion. Bishop almost never made it to France, as his convoy across the Atlantic was attacked by U-boats and several ships were lost. Arriving in Europe in June 1915, Bishop became bored with the infantry and decided to transfer to the Royal Flying Corps. As he said himself, it's clean up there. I'll bet you don't get any mud or horse shit on you up there. If you die, at least it would be a clean death. In September 1915, Bishop became an observer, as so many future aces would do, and would become number 21 squadron's expert on aerial photography, instructing other officers on its techniques. Finally arriving in France in January 1916, Bishop saw action over the lines, but suffered a crash in April of that year, which put him out of commission. Suffering from an injured knee, which was agitated by a fall while recuperating in London, Bishop found himself in a hospital at Branston Square. And this is where his life was to take a turn, propel him towards fame and infamy. Meeting a socialite called Lady St. Helia, who was a friend both to Winston Churchill and secretary for air Lord Hugh Cecil, Bishop was able to secure pilot training with her influence. Although reportedly a terrible student pilot, Bishop had drive and determination which allowed him to win his wings by November 1916. After a short stint flying with a home defence squadron, Bishop requested a transfer to France and arrived at 60 Squadron on the 17th of March 1917. Within days, he had nearly been shot down by Ak Ak. Crash landed a perfectly serviceable aircraft in front of a high-ranking officer who ordered the Green Bishop to return to flying school. The next day, the 25th of March 1917, as if by magic, everything changed. In a fight near saint Leger with a formation of Albatross fighters, Bishop managed to shoot one down which had latched onto his squadron mate, General Higgins, who had witnessed the crash landing, personally congratulated Bishop and rescinded his order to return to flight school. Within 14 days, the average life expectancy of most pilots during bloody April, Bishop had downed five enemy aircraft making him an ace. The same day he achieved his fifth victory, Bishop also shot down his sixth and seventh. By the 1st of June 1917, 
Bishop scores to the 22 victories, a feat he achieved in just 68 days. The next day, he would win the Victoria Cross and divide historians' opinions of this undoubtedly brave man. Some would retain him as a Canadian hero, while others would put him down as a fraud and self-promoting fake. William Bishop would gain a reputation as an aggressive and determined fighter pilot, soon surpassing his personal hero, a fellow 60 Squadron ace, Albert Ball. His German adversaries would also note the prowess of the blue-nosed Newport fighter. One squadron even offered a bounty for his head. By the time he was taken out of the line, Bishop had achieved 72 credited victories in a career in France spanning 454 days from the 22nd of March 1917 to the 19th of June 1918, which is roughly one victory a week, a better ratio than even Manfred von Richthofen. So why did historians question his claims after his death in 1956? And why did some of his contemporaries even decry his success during the war? There are two main areas of contention with the Bishop's story, and they are what led a wave of academics and Great War enthusiasts to question the authenticity of his claims. The first is his remarkable single-handed raid on a German airfield, and the other is the legitimacy of his victory claims. As any student of aerial fighting during the Great War knows, mounting downed aircraft is not as clear-cut as it is today. With no gun camera footage, intelligence officers had to rely on the recollections and observations of pilots in the air. Corroborating claims could be even harder for men like Bishop, who flew many lone patrols and shot down aircraft beyond the observation of frontline troops. Another issue is that a kill, as we might think of it today, wasn't necessarily the same as a victory between 1914 and 1918. In the early days of the war, a victory was awarded simply for making an enemy aircraft disengage and return home. A kill might be awarded even if an aircraft wasn't physically seen to crash. Furthermore, due to the offensive stance of Allied air forces during the Great War, many dogfights occurred behind the German front line trenches, which meant that unlike the Germans, the British and the French could not confirm victories by locating wreckage on the ground. For some historians, it is the lack of written evidence that has really highlighted Bishop, in their minds at least, as a fraud. On most occasions, in some accounts I've read, historians were unable to match a claim by Bishop with a written record of a lost or destroyed aircraft. Others point out that due to the nature of aerial combat in the Great War, what Bishop may have seen as a clearly doomed aircraft disappearing into the ground mist may have actually been a German who regained control before safely landing back at base, meaning that no reported loss was made at that time and location. It is also undeniable that many German records were lost during the brief retreat of 1918, and then again during the bombing of the Second World War. Just because we can't find the record today doesn't mean it never existed. It is interesting that Bishop has been targeted so intently for his assumed false claims when other similar lone fighters such as the great Albert Ball never suffered this attention. It's perhaps the events of the 2nd of June 1917 which raised the most alarm bells for denouncers of Bishop's claims. The daring raid on a German airfield had first been suggested by Albert Ball himself in a conversation with Bishop before he was killed in May 1917. What had been planned as a two-man effort and would have vindicated Bishop's claim became a lone mission on Bishop's return to the front. Beside the fact that no German records report any sort of attack on that date, it's Bishop's own inability to pinpoint which airfield he attacked, which raises questions, as does the missing Lewis gun on his return. On the morning of the 2nd of June 1917, it was still dark when Bishop took off in his famous raid, and the weather, in some accounts, was bad. There is no guarantee that Bishop stayed on course, and may have strayed outside his normal stomping grounds over the 6th Army front. What is known is that Bishop returned safely to his home base, but his Newport fighter was badly damaged 
and the wing-mounted Lewis gun was missing. Bishop reported that while trying to change the magazine, the gun became stuck in the reclined position and he dismounted it and threw it overboard to remove the hazard. Some have claimed, and I think understandably, that it would have been nigh on impossible to remove such a mounting from the air. Others have claimed that the gun was removed on the ground and Bishop himself used the Lewis gun to damage his own aircraft before returning to base, basically claiming he faked the entire mission. However, it seems that it would have been very difficult for the airmen to land behind British lines and remove the gun himself before taking off again. This is because, for one thing, you could not start a Newport's engine from the cockpit alone. And for another thing, leaving the engine running would have led it to tipping onto its nose if Bishop had vacated the seat. The other controversy is that Bishop was awarded the VC on the merits of his own words. No other Victoria Cross has ever been awarded based on the report of the recipient himself. Why did the British authorities so readily believe William Bishop and quickly award him the highest medal for gallantry? After nearly three years of war, enthusiasm for the war was low. In France, the fighting around Verdun the previous year had led to mutinies within the French army. The huge losses of the Somme battles in 1916 for the British had finally led to the authorities publicising the exploits of pilots such as Captain X, then revealed as Albert Ball. With the loss of the boy Ace in May of 1917, it may have been a PR opportunity to raise Bishop to the position of national hero in his stead. This is perhaps, it could be argued, a reaction to the loss of Canada's population during the attacks around Vimy Ridge in April of 1917, where 10,000 casualties were suffered for a population of just 8 million Canadians. Whatever you decide, whether you think William Avery Bishop was an egotistical fraud who inflated his own abilities, or an incredibly fortunate airman who just seemed to be in the right place at the right time, we cannot deny that when the call came, Bishop answered it and survived over 400 days of fighting, where the men who arrived at the front with him in 1916 may have been dead within hours. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Was Bishop a fraud or was he a hero? If you've enjoyed this video, please give me a like. And if you want to learn more about aerial combat in the First World War, why not check out this video here?